Jung is doing a lot of space related uh, research. And in particular, uh, Andrew, Andrew has told me that he's actually on mission to Jupiter. They're designing a, uh, what's that? Uh, spectrometer, mostly spectrometer. <laughs> 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 All right. All right. How you doing? Uh, I'm Adrian. I'm from JPL. I work on space, but today I'm not talking about space too much. Um, there's probably a million disclaimers I'm supposed to give right at the start of this thing. We have all these policies at NASA. They're silly. Uh, I have to sell the lab to you for three slides or something minimum, and then some other stuff, and then I'll talk about the reflective link. So reflector links. Um, I'm also at UCLA. At, uh, as associate. So uh, the work is done between them. I stop keeping track of what's done where anymore. We just file everything together, publish everything together, if at all. And yeah, I don't know where I am most of the time. <laughs> um, quick introduction to JPL and CMOS for Space, which is my core work, where this work that I'm going to talk about came from. I have to sell the lab. It's in my contract. Every time I talk, I have to sell the lab so you taxpayers keep tax paying us. <laughs> so, here we go. So this is the Jet Propulsion Lab. If you've never been there, you should go there. They'll arrest you when you get to the door. <laughs> um, you know, we always joke that, you know, Houston is mission control for NASA, but they only run one spacecraft at a time. Our mission control runs 32 missions right now out of one room. And uh, there's one guy sitting there all the time, and he's just playing PlayStation and not paying attention to all the data streams. <laughs> uh, my lab's down here at the bottom of the lab, so every time there's a flood, I'm the first one to get it. You know, and uh, if you guys know all the rover work that we've done over the years is done, we have a, a Mars yard where they like simulate the environment of Mars to test these rovers. And then they found out on the latest Curiosity mission that there are grain sizes slightly too big. So they spent many dollars of your tax money removing all the pebbles from this giant yard and changing them to a 10% smaller pebble. And uh, it was worthwhile because, you know, you guys know that we broke one of the wheels on Curiosity, right? Because of the rocks. So. Maybe next time in 2020, we won't. Uh, of course, we do assemble all the spacecraft, anything that you love from the past, which I'll talk about apparently on the next one. These are standard. I don't make these slides. Um, historically, you probably know us. The Ranger program was where we got our origins and Explorer program before. So long before NASA landed on the moon, the question was, is the moon a solid object? Can you believe that? In just 1962, they weren't sure the surface was solid. So they built the Ranger to crash into it. And it actually took seven tries to hit the moon. In fact, the history goes, we actually went to Venus with Mariner 2 before we hit the moon with Ranger. So we were actually a planetary lab before we were a you know, lunar science lab. Um, the second program where we got most of our money through the 60s was Surveyor, which was proving that we could land on the moon. Because there's the question, right? is it quicksand? If you land on it, is the spacecraft going to go into the ground? So they gave us lots and lots of money in the 60s to prove we could land on the moon. And we ended up doing it just a couple of months before Apollo 11 made the landing on the moon. So that was, um, that was one of our signatures. Uh, Mariner program, first studies of Mars and Venus, lots of radar work there. Um, these are all before I worked there in case you, I wasn't around in the 70s. <laughs> uh, Galileo, the first study of Jupiter. Voyager program is my favorite program. I am on this a little bit, doing some of the ground hardware. I can tell you all about it, it's amazing. Imagine a spacecraft with 10 watts of power, 384 dB away. And that's what we talk to. You know, so yeah, you're doing your link budget now, wait, wait a second. Yeah, they're very difficult to do. And then uh, of course, Viking, you guys know, was the first landing on another planet. Uh, what else are they gonna make me talk about? And yeah, I have to memorize this stuff. <laughs> Uh, you guys know Cassini out at Saturn? They took that nice picture of Earth a couple of months ago. You can see us wave at Saturn Day. I don't know why they're wasting your tax money on wave at Saturn Day. But, um, Don at Vesta, we just did a comet survey. So uh, everybody, everybody saw that wonderful landing last, uh, last week by ESA. Yeah, so my group did Moreau, which is the radiometer on that little lander, which apparently returned some data, but we're not sure it's good data yet. Um, MER. Spirit Opportunity, that's our lab. 
Um, the New Star Telescope, looking at all the black holes and quasars. By the way, I do a lot of astrophysics, so if you want to ask me about black holes and comets and quasars, I can probably answer that better than all the circuits at this point in my career. And then, you, of course, you guys know Curiosity, which is uh, currently running out of money, actually. Because <laughs> they said two years, and now Congress doesn't want to extend it because it's just a rover on Mars. <laughs> And we have another one coming up, which is 2020. And then Kepler, you guys know we're finding all these exoplanets. So we found, pardon? Uh, Kepler's optical. Yeah. And uh, the, um, that's Herschel. Yeah. yeah. Which is not on my slides, ironically. Because that's an S emission, and we don't want to advertise for Europeans, <laughs> I guess. Um, Kepler found a habitable planet just a couple of months ago. And that one is uh, 1,725 dB away. So at, at X bands, so uh, you're not expecting a uh, signal from that civilization if there was one. <laughs> um, I'm in the submillimeter technology group, and I am indirectly involved in all these things, although I don't lead any of them yet. Um, we did gas shocky mixtures up to 1.9 terahertz, extremely quiet mixtures we use for space. Yes, we do hot electron bolometer mixtures. We put these little integrated transceivers with lots of little mimics and stuff inside. And then we do um, mostly spectrometers. So looking at the spectrum of something on another planet and wondering what's inside, that's our expertise. And we also do some radar. So this is a 680 gig radar. So all the people I talked about radar today, that's the type of antenna you have to suffer at 680 gigahertz. It's unavoidable and it's gonna be half of your mass budget for the instrument and you can't get rid of it. So it doesn't matter, you know, what I always say to people, it doesn't matter what you do all electronics, how small you make them, how good you make them. You have to carry this stupid dish to Jupiter, you know, for eight years. And uh, usually they get annihilated by micrometeors and stuff. So, or, or on Galileo, it didn't even open. So that was good. Um, okay, so my work is CMOS for space. I don't try to compete with these crazy terahertz things that perform so well with CMOS because that's just silly. CMOS is not going to replace these. But what I focus on is back-end processing and these types of things. Because power and weight is everything in space. People, this is the sun from different places in our solar system. By the time you get out to Saturn, it's just like every other star in the sky. Carrying a solar panel out to Saturn is a complete waste of time. Because there's no sun, so there's no electricity. So that means that we have to think about size, weight, and power. Also, NASA's running out of money, perpetually. Every year we're running out of money. And then we get our money, and then we're not running. So we're thinking about smaller platforms always, UAVs and CubeSats, you know. When I came to JPL, we were launching missions to other planets. And then like three years ago, we're talking about, well, we can't go to other planets. Let's just put a lot of telescopes up in Earth orbit. And then like two years ago, they're like, oh, orbit's expensive. You need a rocket. Let's do an airplane. And then they had Sophia and UAVs and all these things. And they're like, oh, man, airplanes need pilots. And that costs money. Let's put it on a balloon. And then now they're thinking, well, balloon still needs a lot of management and ground, and someone has to buy air tickets to go fetch the. So now they're talking about CubeSat, right, which is space garbage. It's a little cube that you put some 9-volt battery and some instrument in, and it runs for a couple of hours, and you throw it away. So as the space program gets smaller and smaller and smaller, our platforms are also getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So there's a huge push for lower size, weight, and power to meet those platforms. Um, the other thing is the rockets themselves are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, the orbital science one's this big now because it's all over the... F <laughs> Anyways, um, we don't have big Saturn Vs and those things anymore. So we're really pushing size, weight, and power just to fit in a rocket. You know, so when there's a, a mission announcement like Europa Clipper, there's 200 scientists fighting for whose three instruments actually make it out there. And the ones that have the lowest footprint are always the winners. So most of my work at JPL that I actually do is, yeah, now, I, now I'm wasting your tax money. Um, I do spectrometer processors, so FFT processors, ADCs, these things, that process chemical signatures. And you know, it's 10% ADC design and 90% chemistry. So I'm getting much better at chemistry now. Um, and we do synthesizers at the bottom, not at the terahertz end, but at the, at the K end and these things. We do some navigation processors and flight systems and these things. And we do a lot of radiometers. Um, 88, 110, and 183 are the big ones. 183 is the best one. And this is all for climate science. So this planet is not in good shape. And that's NASA's position and my position. And my personal position is Congress doesn't want to fix it. So we should at least find all the hurricanes so we can get out of the way. And uh, that's what I work on is detecting uh, extreme weather. And 
These are typically the bands you do that. Anywhere there's a water line. Water line is the key to the whole thing. So that was my NASA talk, and now I'm not going to talk about space anymore, unless you ask me a question, which I have a contract in educational mandates. So I have to answer <laughs> properly. Okay, so reflective links. So uh, I got asked to give this talk about reflective links, although we've really only started doing this work pretty recently. So where did it come from? Oh, one more NASA slide. Okay, where it came from is we were struggling with this problem. This is a very classic instrument problem. It's a problem of drift. So we want to measure something to one part in a trillion, usually, of methane or ammonia or something. And the problem is all our receivers and stuff drift over time. They're only stable in the window of 10 to 50 seconds, which sounds like not a lot, but that's, all, that's not a long time when you're taking thousands of measurements over weeks and weeks and weeks around some planet. So the question is how to calibrate. And what we usually do is we have a little motor, and he points at the target on the planet, and then he motors to this calibration target where we know the temperature, and goes back and forth to do the subtraction, and then you have a nice clean instrument. Now, we had a mission where this motor failed. And we all got yelled at an awful lot. And it turns out somebody like didn't put the screw in the motor or something ridiculous like that. But mechanical parts in general are bad for space. So we spent a lot of time looking at reflector rays where you could change the phase of the reflector ray so our instrument can point to two different places without a moving part. And also there's no fasteners in here, so nothing will be forgotten. And then this is where our, all our reflector work came from, was me struggling with this problem. Uh, to give you numbers, this was all done at one terahertz. All this stuff was a one terahertz exercise. So the basic idea of a reflector link is not new. If you go back through the literature, you can find in 1948 somebody already came up with this idea. They didn't formalize it, they didn't understand it, but they did propose it in like a one-page letter. So you have something illuminate something else, and then you, somebody sticks their hand in the way, and you have some kind of detector. And what you're seeing is you're seeing the reflection be modulated. So it's kind of interesting because this side doesn't need to generate any illumination. It doesn't have a transmitter or a millimeter wave source or RF source. It just has something that reflects. So that's kind of interesting. How could we use this? Well, we can make a data link. So the brain dead way to do it is you put a switch. And if you terminate an antenna, it's going to not reflect anything or not reflect much. If you don't terminate the antenna, it's going to reflect. And then you put a square wave in and you get some kind of modulated square wave out. So it makes perfect sense. It seems very simple and it seems to work very well until you actually build it. Um, the other thing that's even more interesting, oh, this is the same thing again. Why would I put something? Yeah, so then you can have a transmitter, which is like a, some continuous source, which the FCC will frown at you for, but as long as you're under the 16 dBm, they can't put you in jail. They can only frown at you. And then you uh, turn the switch on and off, and you get some reflected signal, and then you get some data out. So it's super simple, and super simple is always something that'll work. So we start with that. The other thing that's interesting is it doesn't have to be amplitude. If you change the termination, termination condition, you change the phase of whatever load you put there, you can select between different phases, and that's PSK. So that, this was our major, I guess, the part that we picked up and wasn't done before, is you can do PSK like this. So, you, know, you can have as many, as many throws as you want on your switch or can tolerate on your switch. You can do more. You can even mix the two ideas and do like a partial termination to get your QAM if you wanted to suffer QAM. Uh, okay, so. Um, for reasons that I can't explain or understand, we chose to do this at millimeter wave first. Probably because of the lab I work in, it's just like finding five gigahertz source is a pain. Finding a 300 gigahertz source is easy. That's the nature of JPL. I, I, so we just used what we had. So our first idea was, hey, if we did this for millimeter wave, we could have the wearable device send a signal, like a big video, to a mobile device. And we could do it without burning all the power, but still be 1180 compatible. Maybe. So that was like the, the fake application we started out with. And it, it sounds really good. So we did you know, the basic, you go into your little HFSS simulator or whatever, and you simulate the reflection, and off it goes, and use ADS or something. And sure, it works in the simulation, so that's encouraging. And then I go to my manager, and I say, I have a good simulation for a wireless link. What plan is that for? <laughs> So uh, and I had, it took a lot of time to formally explain why we want to do this and have a good application that makes some kind of sense. But we did. And the cool thing is it's just a switch, right? So there's no power used in the wearable or whatever, whatever very sad battery you have in your wearable electronics. 
So we made the first one. Um, this is just a prototype. Um, I'm a chip maker, so when I don't know what to do or I don't understand what I'm doing, I make a chip because that's all I know how to do. So we built the switch. It's a super simple switch. It's just got some impedance matching, and then there's some switch in there, and it changes the transformer from a short to open or the closest approximation you can make at these frequencies. Um, this was done at 90 and 170 gigahertz, I believe. And then you need an antenna. Um, doing antenna on a silicon chip is a pain because silicon's conductive and it's very, very, very lossy substrates. So we used a membrane. We have this fancy NASA membrane stuff. Uh, it's an antenna printed on a material I'm not allowed to tell you on top of something else I'm not allowed to tell you. But what it does is it allows for very, very low loss and it's very good at extreme temperatures. Not because we want to do our data link at extreme temperatures, just because it's what we had. Um, so to give you some numbers, it's about 90% radiation efficiency on that thing. So we did the simplest test you can. We uh, dug around the lab. and You cannot find a Wi-Fi transceiver at JPL. You can find these things on every shelf. It's a one gigahertz, sor uh, one milliwatt source, and then a down converter. And then we put our little chip and we shine some horns on it. It's like the stupid proof of concept. We turn the switch on and off. Can we see something? Hey, we can see something. How exciting is that? We have a great idea. And then there's some reflection in the middle, and there's some modulation or some data. So the power is really, really low. So that was kind of interesting. Hey, we have something that might be something that might someday become useful for someone, which is pretty much everything we make at NASA. <laughs> um, so then we turn the speed up. We got a BERT and all those proper things, and we turn the speed up. And sure enough, it works. It, it, you know, 400 megabit per second. The eye diagram starts to look not wonderful. But 300 is still pretty good. 200 is still pretty good. So it was able to work. The power you need is not tremendous. One milliwatt over a couple of centimeters. Bit error rate, not too offensive. Hey, it's uncoded. So anything is good when it's uncoded, right? No error correction. Um, setup's limited. Can't go very far. You run out of power very, very quickly. When you're starting with a milliwatt, and you know, uh, we're doing this in the basement also, so there's lots of moisture. So it's not going across the room or anything. Um, so, summary of the millimeter wave part of my fun was, it's high. We're able to go fast, but it doesn't go very far. And it's super duper simple. So, it still needs a tremendous amount of work. Somebody's going to have to build a modem. Uh, we're not stuck at 110. Um, I just stole out of other people's labs until we had the full chain. You could do 60. You could do anything else. It would work. Um, so, then we got into the microwave. So, I decided that, hmm. Millimeter wave is just a bad business decision all around. Um, let's go to microwave where the money is made. So we thought about it, and we decided to explore these lower frequencies. And one of the things we want to do is get further range. So with that millimeter wave, we were only going like this far. And if you're thinking about your smartwatch or your glasses, right, you don't want to like transfer the data like that all the time. And if you take it off, what's the point? So can we get a meter? Can we get two meters? Sacrifice the data rate, fine, it's not millimeter wave, it's not fast, but it's still fast enough to do Wi-Fi service or Wi-Fi connectivity. So we started looking at that. We started simple. Um, we had the chip already. So we made a nice antenna, pretty basic stuff, just on a Rogers. And we built a little link when we had some horn antenna shine. And uh, I couldn't get any of my students to put their head on this thing, so I just got a water bottle. You know, the, the water content's similar, the intelligence is similar, everything's about the same. <laughs> so uh, we use that just to model what it would be like if you wear it. Um, so sure enough, a couple of meters is possible. 2.5 megabit, very low power, uh, better than 10 minus. It looks OK. So you could actually do something like this. Um, here was the trick to this, besides the messy lab. Um, uh, it, yeah, it's, yeah. The transmitter is, uh, I guess I missed that somewhere. The transmitter is just a carrier. Okay. It's not modulated. It's not carrying data. It's just a tone. I see, but you do need those. You need uh, some energy in the environment, right? Okay. Yeah. Those, can those be ambient or they can't be? Ambient is, mo ambient is modulated. And we don't like modulated. Um, for this, you don't want modulated. But I don't consider, you know, my long-term plan would be don't turn this on all the time have some other link like Bluetooth or something low power, tell it to turn on, download the data, then turn on. You don't want like a 2.4 gigahertz or 6 gigahertz CW all the time because it means everybody else has a blocker problem. 
It's just when you want to move your, I don't know, movie or your picture files or something. So then we kept going, and I got a little bit of money out of JPL. Uh, the hardest thing I've ever done since I got there is convince NASA to invest some money in a data link. I told them it would go on the space station. So if you guys ask, if anybody ever asks you, say this talking about space station data link. <laughs> and then I'm covered. Um, so we did something similar. We used these rather large panels. We don't really need the gain, but they're cheap and they were around. And then we used a commercial switch instead of my chip. Um, the reason we did this is a little bit more flexible because we can change the termina termination condition. So uh, you know, we built a little reflector. Um, I gave my student a, a 10 minute class on how to make antenna when you don't know what you're doing. So what you do is you, how we built this is super simple. You put the structure and you get a pair of scissors and you put it on the VNA and you watch the return loss and you keep clipping until it's in the right place. And that's good enough to do the experiment. So from that, we did 2.5 meters and sure enough, it looks nice and good. BER looks good. At 5.83, we're able to get a nice data rate, competitive for no power. Um, you don't need to blast the room with a watt, you know, 100 milliwatts, 90 milliwatts is enough. So you could see this becoming commercial. You don't need a giant power amplifier, I think is the takeaway of that. Um, we're not really limited um, from SNR or those things. Really, it's just the switch that we bought doesn't go that fast. So we're kind of stuck doing these tests. Um, still, it's a good eye diagram. Data rate's good, bit error rate's good, sort of works. Um, then we moved into the phase modulation, looking at phase modulation. So we start with the easy one, which is BPSK, because it's easy to modulate. So you have some switch, and then it selects between an open condition and a short condition. So anybody here knows transmission line theory, open and short have opposite reflection phase. So when you switch from this one to this one, you're changing the reflection phase of the antenna. So we're able to do this over four meters, 10 megabit. There's the eye diagram. It's coherent detector. Uh, it's, uh, it's fully coherent. Everything's coherent in that test. Um, then we started talking about longer ranges. So this is over six or seven meters. So we can go pretty far if you turn up the power. So that's the FCC limit on that 5.8 band. Uh, and uh, actually the 0.6 would send me to jail. So it's a little bit over the FCC limit, but you can imagine six meters. And you know, we're not trying to replace Wi-Fi. We're just like in your workstation trying to talk to your wearable device so you can move your video file. Does anybody have a Google Glass? Does anybody notice it doesn't last very long when the Wi-Fi is on? Are you getting more than 10 minutes out of your glass? Around there, right? Yeah, it's, it's not pretty. So some solution like that would be super helpful. This guy here, the little reflector chip, uses about five milliwatts total. Um, you'd probably need some coating or something on top of that. Okay, so then what's the core problem of this great idea, which is super simple and from 1948? Everything good was invented right around World War II. Um, so the biggest problem is ambience, which is that you have something in the back, you know, you have four pi in direction and the reflector's there and everything else is still reflecting. So you get this huge blocker, which is that unmodulated thing coming back at you. And um, it's desensitizing your receiver. Because it's many and many and many and many of dB, much, much stronger than you. So you're going to need to come up with a plan to deal with this. Some people try to do modulation on top of that tone to push it away. And then you have to find some crazy filter bank or something or do baseband processing or have a really tough A to D to digitize it. Um, Here's an example of it. There's a reflector. Um, and then we have some big metal thing. I think it's a tool chest or something. And then when we don't have the metal, it looks good. And the moment you put the metal there, it's desensitized in your toast. So you, nobody wants Wi-Fi that only works when, you're not, when you don't have walls in your building. So something needs to be done to address that. And that's what we've been working on most recently. So the, the brain dead way is, at millimeter wave anyways, we came up with, um, I didn't get the results cleared, so I can only show you the drawing, not the hardware. JPL is a funny place. Um, you can tilt the pattern of your antenna. So what happens is that the geometric reflection, the dispersion from, from landing on the surface and reflecting back, will come directly normal to you. It'll come back, you know, it's just first order um, you know, geometry, right? But if you tilt the pattern, what goes into the chip 
gets reflected off the termination and comes back out will come in a different direction. So you can break the geometry between regular reflection and the reflection that's electrically absorbed and retransmitted. This works really, really well at millimeter wave. We have good results, which I didn't get cleared because I'm stupid. Um, it doesn't work so well at microwave because the beam patterns aren't good and the gains aren't high to begin with. Um, so what we came up with is this clever trick to cancel. So what we do is we say, well, the blocker, we know it perfectly, right? It's just what we transmitted with some phase shift and some amplitude change. So we can make a replica and stick it into the receiver. And if we play with the phase and we play with amplitude enough, we should be able to suppress that. Super duper simple. So we did a super duper simple experiment where we took our lab setup and we put the phase shifter and the attenuator and they're, they're um, programmable by student. So the student turns the knob and that gets the setting. And then we looked at what you can get from that. And uh, sure enough, if you turn the knobs, you can get a reduction and then you get your eye diagram back because you're not desensitized. Now, people who are perfectionists, like people at NASA say, well, this is, this is no good. There's still something there. You need to suppress it all. It actually doesn't need to be suppressed all the way. This just goes to DC in your receiver. You just need to push it down enough that it's not desensitizing. You don't need a million dB reduction. You just need to cut the top off so it's not making your receiver saturate. So good enough. So if I'm using a real parent device, mm -hmm. that the parent device would have some noise figure. Yes. Sorry, which one? The one leaking from T to R? Or? The transmitter is not a pure spectral line. It radiates an amplified white noise. You're, ta you're talking about the phase noise skirt? Or just? Well, both of them. OK. Because the phase noise skirt, sure. even if your phase noise skirt sure. is, is not there, sure. paramps don't have good noise figure either. And you've got yes. Gain, yes. So, so it's radiating, I don't know, minus mm -hmm. 10 dB to Hertz. So you're talking about canceling the side noise, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the one of the nice parts about this is that the LO that we use for down conversion is the same LO because they're co-located. They're not on the reflector. They're over here. So we have full correlation of the noises in the LO. Ah, range to correlated by you know yeah, distance over C. Yeah. Yeah. But cer certainly enough to squeak a data signal through. Um, so then the last part of my talk, which is not much, it's a slide and a half, I think, is that we're building a custom chip to do this calibration right now. In fact, it, it just went and it's actually back on my desk and when I find time in life, I'll play with it. Um, obviously, if people are walking around the environment, the phase relation of this reflector in the background is going to be changing as people are moving and things are moving and weather is changing the surface of the earth or whatever. So you need to adapt and you need to do it quickly. Because people move fast and phase changes quickly, and especially indoors. So the dedicated chipset we're building is doing all that calibration, phase and amplitude. It's all on chip, programmable, digital. And there's an ASIC, and it's doing it on a, like a microsecond basis. So as fast as a Wi-Fi packet. So every time you send a new, another Wi-Fi packet, it should be calibrated again. And that calibration doesn't last forever, but it's good enough to last for that packet's duration. So uh, that's what I've been doing when I'm not working on space. Um, we also have a link modulator we just built with the QPSK1 and ASK1 that's coming back, I don't know, next week or something. I lose track. OK, so my summary is JPL, for reasons I can't explain in NASA, have developed this thing because I developed this thing. Um, it lets really low power happen on one side of the link, but not the other. The other side is still burdened. But it's interesting because wearable devices can have connectivity without killing the battery in 30 seconds. Um, it seems to work well at millimeter wave if you want really short things. So you're thinking like docking station or um, I don't know, the mobile to mobile, like all those things that already lost money. And then microwave looks more promising for a couple of meters and reasonable data rates, like 802.11 type data rates. It's 10 megabit now, but we've built that better switch and I expect at least 50, 60 megabit. But the major issue is that background radiation. And there are lots of ways I can still think of solving that in the future. So that was my talk. So, thank you. 
Sure. Yeah. Way, yeah. And then your reflector is actually the device, like a mobile device or a Google Glass. Yeah. You also transmit something or download or, or receive something yeah. from. Transmit, transmit. Oh, or transmit something yeah. to the, trans the actual receiver, yeah. maybe a, a server or something to yeah. download or to send it. Yeah. And that's why that the, the wearable device, which is a reflector, is going to use a very small amount of power. Yeah, there's no. High power transmit. Uh, it doesn't. Yeah. The first optical communication system is being used on ships. It was a guy standing there with a, a white flag and a black flag. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's his principle. Yep. Right. He's not radiating any power, he's just reflecting. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So he's basically transmitting, he's basically converting the power source to the, to the base station, the transmitter. Yeah. From an architecture point of view, what it is, is that one side of this link does not need LO generation and does not need. Power amplification. What about downloading things to the wearable? Okay, so that's, that's the part that everybody always asks me. You are already shining high power. Where do we go back, 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 back? About there. You are already shining a tremendous amount of power from your base station. Right. And you don't need a fancy LNA and all those things. You can just use a detector. That's what we're doing right now. You know, just some very cheap, cheesy, non coherent link. Yeah. Normally you would never use on off keying, but because the S and R margin is so high, you can squeak away with it. And again, I'm not after that 50 meter market. I'm after the like. So, uh, I was just intrigued about the FCC issue. Are, are you using a digital spectrum that's unlicensed, or is you This is unlicensed, but there's still an emission limit. You can't bake all the people. <laughs> yeah. This is 583, the 583 band. Okay. Yeah. All right. And you, you said they don't like modulation pairing. They don't like, I mean, if you turn this on, you know, your cell phone's not going to link up. It's still a strong blocker, right? If you're filling the environment with a tone and band. So, you know, my, my vision of this is you're only going to have this, this, uh, It's, in, it's within the Wi-Fi band, right? The 11 AC band. The 802.11 that we, yeah. So you won't take out your cell phone, it'll take out a Wi-Fi. I meant the Wi-Fi on your phone, yeah. Okay. Sorry, yeah. So, you know, I envision this only turning on when there's a request to trans do mass transfer and turn off again right away. Yeah. Okay. And we're doing other stuff. We're, we're looking at multi-users too. We have a clever scheme for that and all the classics, which is very strange to be doing in the NASA center, might I say. But it's for the space station. I keep telling people it's for the space station. So, yep. yep. They, need, they need wireless links to communicate in a space they can easily hear each other in. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Do you think the millimeter way will be able to catch up? Because now the millimeter way have much longer range than the five meter you have in this. Um, I'll give you excuses for that. Um, millimeter wave antenna is much smaller, typically. Which is good for consumer applications because it's smaller. But that also means it captures much less incident power. And that hurts the SNR. Yeah. yeah. If you can, you know, the ultimate dream is if you could beam steer to this thing, right. then maybe it has application. So that would improve the cost. Yeah. Do you, have you tried for the, for the whole antenna, for the transmitting receiver, you use the whole antenna? Yep, that was the first test. Well, but we so started with, using we use regular planar. Yeah. Uh, have you tried this over the regular Wi-Fi device? Oh, you can't. Because you can't, because I need CW. Yeah. yeah. There's no easy way to take a Wi-Fi card and make it give CW. So that was the thinking. Um, 
if there are, I haven't gone too far into that yet. I believe there should be regular collision resolving ways to deal. Yeah. 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 I don't think it would need to be special because from the receiver's point of view, it just looks like two Wi-Fi transmissions. Yeah. 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 If all of us had a Google Glass, Google would be happy. <laughs> but we don't, so they're not. <laughs> yeah. I think it would help. And the problem is at JPL, I have beamforming equipment, but only at 670 gigahertz, which is silly. So, yeah, it's a great research topic. Go do it. <laughs> You could imagine doing like, I don't know, I'm engineering now. Um, I don't know, have it just chop out some tone and just scan and look for the tone and then start. Yeah, or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're pushing this guy away from that thing, right? right. Yeah. Yeah, that's good for the back end. For us, we're finding it's, the, it's that front end desensitization up at RF. Front end like that, the first LNA. You mean just because of, because of IN3 Yeah, yeah, right in the front, crunching the... Pretty far, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. But there's another dimension to it. If you have the reflector starting to do passband modulation, it starts to look like a transceiver again and the power starts to creep up. Yeah. That's just well. Megahertz or something? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-